I know that most of what proceeds out of the mouths of British politicians on those subjects and many others is pure, ignorant, fatuous drivel. They simply have no idea. You still hear them saying, we want more bobbies on the beat. Bobbies? Beat? There's been no such thing as a bobby for 50 years, or a beat. To say you want more bobbies on the beat is just an expression of, 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 of moronic ignorance. Both you don't know what's happened, you don't know how to tackle it. And, and they say, we, we're going to have more police. What difference does it make if you have more police if they don't do anything? Hi, everyone. Uh, today is February the 5th. And I'm going to be interviewing Peter Hitchens, the Mail on Sunday columnist. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Labour Party following its most recent general election defeat and different aspects of our democratic system here in the UK. Peter is an incredibly well-read and intelligent journalist who I've actually never seen dodge a question before, so I think this should be a really interesting interview. Uh, do subscribe to this channel, guys. And uh, if there's anyone you'd like me to interview in the future, then let me know in the comments below. With that said, I hope you enjoyed this one. Peter. Thanks a lot for agreeing to talk to me today. Um, less than a week before Jeremy Corbyn became Labour leader in 2015, um, you wrote a piece about how you were in attendance at a speech he gave in Cambridge, and you wrote the following. Uh, it was completely coherent, delivered fluently without notes by a man who obviously still writes his own speeches and understands what he is saying. Every statement in it obviously resulted from a long and considered examination of the subject, and he could have defended every assertion if he had to. This was itself a refreshing change from most modern political speeches. Would you say that your characterization of Jeremy Corbyn there as somebody who delivered coherent political messages could still be applied to the Jeremy Corbyn that fought last year's general election? Well, less so, because the more you get swallowed up by political machines and advisors and public relations men, the less you're able to be yourself. So I, I think that at that stage in his political life, he was, he was more able to be uh, intellectually respectable than he became later. So no, probably not. I think it was, it was something of a stroke of luck that I happened to see that performance. In, in what way do you think he was swallowed by the party machine? Well, everybody is. I, party machines become our, our uh, engines for obtaining office. And in the end, they become terrified of, 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 of this, this thing, which a word no one uses in normal life, gaffes. They can become terrified of people making, saying things which can then be exploited by your enemies to make you look stupid. Uh, they become terrified of going off a very carefully designed message, which has been squared with an awful lot of people. And it just becomes much more difficult for the individual politician to speak as himself of what he himself believes, and much more important to his uh, his aides and ultimately to himself to, to pr deliver the performance that he has been primed and rehearsed to give. This is one of the effects of, uh, of, of what you might call low-grade universal suffrage uh, democracy. You're you increasingly, you've, you're afraid to say what you really mean or to say what you really think or to express yourself freely because you're afraid that your opponents will misrepresent and exploit what you said to destroy you. And you're afraid that your allies will desert you because you haven't kept to a line which you agree with them. So it, it is, uh, it, it's a sad reflection on the nature of universal suffrage, democracy in a poorly educated society. And a very, a very conformist society as well, much more conformist than anybody ever I think imagined it would be. I think even John Stuart Mill imagined a society as conformist as this one has become, not a free society. That's this conformist, anyway. Conformist in what way? Well, it's conformist in, in the, everybody's education now pretty much in the same way. Uh, they're taught what to think but not how to think. And the pressure of electronic media is quite different from the, the, the conformist pressure, say, of, of, of books alone uh, or the stage. Because what everybody sees on television, what everybody sees on their telephone screen, is the same thing, the same jokes. Uh, the same assumptions over and over again, and people are even expected to look the same. So the pressure in, of fashion on both appearance, manner of speech, sense of humour, attitude, what it's permitted to say in public, how it's permitted to say it, the tone of voice in which you're permitted to say it, is incredibly strong. I'm lucky enough to have grown up before this happens, so I, I, I have an awful lot more individuality as a result, and I find the conformism of, of modern Britain terrifying and dispiriting as well but it's definitely a much more conformist society than it used to be or than it should be, and electronic media have helped to make it so. So do you think that because we're exposed to uh, TV so much more, 
than, than we used to be. That now, when it comes to politics, the stylistic appeal of politicians is prioritised over the policy substance they have oh, yeah, to very offer. Much so. yeah. People have to conform to a certain expectation of how they should sound and what sort of things they should uh, say and in what, sort of, uh, in what sort of manner they should say them. The, the old manners of speech, which people had developed in, in, in old-fashioned upbringings, first of all, in their homes and in, in, in private life and then in schools which are much more unlike each other than they are now and then in parts of the country which are more unlike each other than they are now. The accents that people had, the, the forms of, uh, the, the senses of humour that they had, the, uh, the, the, the rhythms in their speech were wholly different and you could find in, in Parliament, you could still until quite recently find it I think in the House of Lords, a great deal more variety in expression than you find now and not just in expression but also a great, a great deal more variety in opinion. Is that why then, perhaps, when Ed Miliband was Labour leader, people were very focused on how he ate a sandwich and how, how he spoke in a very nasal way? This is, this, this, is, this is what has happened. It's become a matter of image rather than of reality. Hmm. Uh, just going back to, to the Labour Party, um, when you listen to interviews of people in Bolsover, in, in um, Blythe Valley, you know, places five years ago, you'd never expect Labour to... to lose in, in a general election. Uh, there, there is this sense people have that the Labour Party has taken them for granted. What, what do you think that speaks to, Peter? Well, I think that the Labour Party did take them for granted and it's paid a price for that. And I think it wasn't impossible to imagine it because of what happened in Scotland. Scotland had been a warning to the Labour Party and to any political party. You cannot take for granted any more the traditional tribal vote, that something may happen which completely destroys it. What I don't think anyone would have predicted would that, it, would that it would have been Alexander Johnson who would have been the person who overcame it, of all people. But there it was. That's how it happened. Uh, there were all kinds of other things which, which became involved. But I think the, the problem has been for a long time that Labour really became increasingly after the middle 1950s and uh, Tony Crossland's Future of Socialism and... Roy Jenkins's uh, manifesto book of around about the same period, uh, the Labour case. Labour became increasingly the uh, the political arm of metropolitan bourgeois bohemians, using the old working class vote to obtain office, but to, to pursue policies which weren't particularly in the interests of trade union members and working class men and women. And it takes a long while for that kind of exploitation actually to, to pull a movement apart, but I think it, the strain had been on for some long time. And when I think, I remember um, Labour beginning to worry about the effect of its mass immigration policies on its own voters, uh, that was the point at which the rupture really came. When was that? Well, I know Chris Bryant and I having a brief confrontation on the Andrew Neil uh, lunchtime program must be six or seven years ago now. And I said, you're, you're, trying, you're trying to persuade people that you don't actually believe the things that you do believe and you didn't mean to do the things that you meant to do and it won't work. And I was right about that. It wouldn't work. It didn't work. Do you think that... I mean, we hear a lot about how Brexit, I know you hate the phrase Brexit, um, uh, the, the term, sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to have to use that as a shorthand throughout this interview. But um, do you, do you it, a lot has been said about how it's caused um, lots of division in society. Well, what it did was, and this is, the, this is the, the problem with holding a referendum at all, the referendum detribalized politics. The parties were not standing in the referendum. So people were liberated from their tribes. Uh, although a very subtle effort was made by some of the cleverer people in the Leave campaign to, 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 make their, to make their campaign more appealing to Labour voters, note the shade of red used in the, uh, in, in, in the Leave stickers. It's exactly the same shade of red used by the Labour Party. And that wasn't accidental. I'm sure there were many, many careful meetings uh, over, over that choice of colour and probably over the choice of typeface too, to make Labour voters feel at home voting leave. But they were detached from their tribe. And having been detached from it, uh, it, it turned out not to be that easy to get them to go back to it.
So it base the the whole vote exposed a lot of division as well. Oh, completely. I, the, to me, the great grief is it didn't expose a similar division in the Conservative Party. I think the the, the, the Conservative Party has betrayed and abandoned its traditional tribal vote just as totally as the Labour Party had. But somehow or other, the Conservative Party survived this. Yeah, and and the Conservative Party has just won a, a landslide victory. So, uh, do you, with that said, you've called, called the Conservative Party a dead party before. Do you think then Labour did it's more to... A dead party. It's a dead party which, is, which, which um, despite being dead, managed to get access to an awful lot of money and an awful lot of electoral skill and which found itself up against an opponent which was in a way even deader. Yes, yeah, so do you think Labour... I mean, you've heard of unpopularity contests. <laughs> now now, now you're, you're, we're actually having deadness contests. Which of us is deader? So do you think Labour did more to lose the election? Yes, I think Labour lost rather than the Tories won. I mean, what, what, what was it that they offered that made people want them in office? I don't think anything. There was nothing but a load of slogans. Uh, they, they just became, just as I think Donald Trump became President of the United States because he was not Hillary Clinton. Uh, Johnson became Prime Minister because he was not Jeremy Corbyn. Did Labour just not ha have a bad hand when it came with Brexit, though? Well, if it, if it did have a bad hand, it was a bad hand it dealt itself. Sure. But, but, and okay. Labour's position on the European issue, Labour's official national position on the European issue, has been self destructive for a very long time. There have been intelligent people in the Labour Party for many, many years since Hugh Gates and Peter Shaw, who've seen the dangers to Labour from the European project. Uh, but they were just pushed completely to one side by the Blairites. The only, the last flickering uh, trace of, 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 of the old Labour attitude towards the European issue was Ed Balls's dogged opposition to joining the Euro, uh, which I don't think people are grateful enough to him for having done, because if it hadn't been for Ed Balls, who I think pretty much influenced Gordon Brown in that direction, I think Blair would probably have got us into the Euro one way or another, but he didn't. And the, so there was, there was still enough sense in the Labour Party to know that, that, that there, are, there are aspects of the European project which are, which are directly and obviously damaging to Labour voters, but by and large it was buried by the Blairites. What would have been the consequence of us joining the Euro, do you think? Well, I think an awful lot of economic and political damage would have been done. Uh, it's difficult to quantify. I think look at, the, look at what's happened to the, to the, to the Eurozone members. Uh, since, the, since the thing came into being, and look at the, the, the absence of freedom to control their own economic policies and subjection of their economic policies to basically to German and French desires, and you'll see that the, 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 in a gradation from, f from Greece to Spain uh, just how badly that's affected them. I think that the, 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 particularly the unemployment problems for young people in a lot of the European Euro, Eurozone countries uh, are, is, a, is, an, is just an example of how having a, a single currency for many separate nations simply does not work. Uh, I, after the Brexit vote, I um, watched a report um, you did where you went to Boston. Um, and it was a great report, by the way. Um, so, um, for people who don't know who are watching, Boston voted 76% to leave um, between 2004-2014, so I think a 460% spike in immigration. Do you think it was ever possible for Labour to come up with a Brexit policy at the election that would satisfy Leave voters in Boston and Remain voters in, say, Putney? Well, no, but it wasn't possible for anybody else to come up with such a policy either. And what uh, what people in Boston were really voting against was was the nature of modern Britain, uh, a low wage economy uh, in which very large numbers of young people have been so badly educated that they're unemployable uh, and will not do some of the, some of the most basic jobs in our economy. And what goes on around Boston is very, very basic agriculture. You know, leaks and beets and things like that lifted from the ground, which requires long, hard, unskilled work. And it's very hard to find people in Britain who will do that anymore. And the reason why very large numbers of migrants came to the Boston area was because those jobs needed doing and they were available to do them and the, the, the migration laws allowed them to come and the employers were glad to have them. The problem was the social consequences of that for a small, sleepy uh, Lincolnshire town were colossal and unexpected and they caused a lot of discontent. And that, that's the reason for my whole connection with Boston such as it is, is because a, a reader of mine wrote to me and said, come to Boston and come and see, I'll show you around. 
and he should be banned. And he was absolutely, you know, he hated the BNP. One of the reasons he, he was interested in it was because he'd, he'd, he'd seen the BNP sniffing around and didn't, uh, didn't at all like the look of what they were up to. But he, he said, you should come and see what's going on in this town. It's completely astonishing. So I wrote about it. And then later on, I tended to feel that by writing about it, I might have made, had some effect on the attitudes of, of, of people in, in the area and maybe even had, had had some effect on the, the way the vote turned out. So when I was invited to go back and take a look, I went back and took a look. And, and I, what I found principally was that the problems that people had been worried about hadn't really been solved. There's a lot of goodwill there, actually. Um, uh, most Bostonians are determined not to have conflict with the new arrivals, and most of the new arrivals have made a very considerable effort to settle in. But it's still, have you been? Not it's extraordinary to see the, 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 the breadth and depth of, of, of the change that has been visited by circumstances completely beyond anybody's control on a, a rather small town. And it's just been transformed. People's lives are unrecognisable from the way they were 20 or 30 years ago in a very short period of time. Nobody ever asked them. Uh, People are bound to be discontented if they're not asked. I remember there was a, a bit in your report where you were with a, a real estate agent and he talked about Boston now being vibrant. You said not everyone wants to yeah, be vibrant. vibrant. Yeah, not everyone wants to be vibrant. Not what everybody wants to be. Yeah. yeah. So what did you mean by that? Well, I mean, I mean by that that people don't necessarily want to have their, the areas, the, the neighbourhoods in which they live, you know, previously you know, quiet family neighbourhoods, uh, transformed into the sort of places where young single people live in large numbers. I uh, just want to get back onto the Labour Party. Um, last week there was a report uh, into Labour's general election failure. It was done by a couple of Labour MPs and it was leaked. And they basically, in one part, criticised uh, the media for negatively impacting Jeremy Corbyn's chances of becoming Prime Minister. And they said it was an assault without precedent in modern politics. Is, is that fair or is that just sour grapes? Not about without precedent. Um, I think... Uh, when I think of the way in which the media in general, I'm not saying this is, this is broadcasting, but certainly newspapers, uh, dealt with Neil Kinnock and Michael Foote, uh, I think there's precedent. Um, whether it was justified in those cases is something you can have an argument about. But um, certainly a lot of people at the time on the left felt that it was pretty savage. Uh, so unprecedented, I'm not sure. What, what makes it very hard for a lot of people to understand it is what makes it very hard for a lot of people to understand modern politics at all, which is why would it be that an organisation such as the BBC, which is fundamentally quite left-wing, should be against, and I think it's fair to say that it was not sympathetic to, uh, the, um, the Corbynite Labour Party. And at the same time as the conservative, the, 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 the conservative newspapers, which are always hostile to the Labour Party, were as well. So you have a very unusual, uh, apparently um, uh, nonsensical alliance between the supposed right-wing newspapers and the supposed left-wing BBC against a left-wing Labour leader. And you can't make sense of that unless you're a, either a Marxist or you used to be one. What? Can you make sense of I it? can make perfect sense of it. I can make perfect sense of all British politics because I used to be a Marxist and it's, it, it doesn't, it, 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 it falls very neatly into place. But even the categories that I use are incomprehensible to most people. I, if I say such and such a thing is, is Gramscian or I refer to the long march of the institutions uh, or, I ref, or I use the term Eurocommunist, people look at me blankly. What are you talking about? And if I say that the Blair government was, in fact, one of the most left-wing governments since Oliver Cromwell, people say, no, no, but he was a Tory, and, and so on and so forth. And it's not true. But the real problem in, 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 between the BBC and Jeremy Corbyn wasn't that Jeremy Corbyn was left-wing. Jeremy Corbyn was the wrong, wrong kind of left-wing. For this, you have to go back right into the, into, into the Kinnock era, when the, the Labour Party was pretty much taken over by 60s. Marxists such as myself, who, had, uh, who were no longer shouting in the street uh, revolutionary Marxists, but had learnt in the course of rising up through their careers in the law and journalism and the, the academy and wherever else it was, the civil service, had learnt that they could still be radical, 
uh, provided they didn't appear too radical and they could have an enormous effect on society if they were cunning and subtle about what they did. And also they were, they'd been liberated from any suggestion of disloyalty or, or enmity towards this country by the collapse of the Soviet Union during the whole period of the Cold War. Anyone on the left had a slight taint especially when it came to things like defence policy and foreign policy, had a slight taint of, well, are you really sympathetic towards the Soviet Union and are you really on the wrong side of the Cold War? When the Soviet Union collapsed, all that ended. The left was completely liberated and it was able to, to, to compete finally on, on level terms and, and couldn't be tainted in that way. And it was very relieved. It also, it, wasn't, it didn't have hanging around its neck the very albatross of the Soviet Union, that terrible political, social, economic disaster with secret police and, uh, and, 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 and the invasion of Czechoslovakia and the invasion of Hungary and the crushing of Poland. And they didn't have to, any of that around their necks anymore. And they, could, so they could just pursue a left-wing policy far more freely than anybody had been able to do really for, for, for a century. And they did. But it's fantastically left-wing party. I, very large numbers of members of, of Blair's cabinet uh, were uh, ex-Marxists, but how ex were they? I, I am an ex-Trotskyist, and I, you know that because I make it public, and I say so, and I, I will discuss till people drop to the ground with boredom exactly why I'm no longer a Trotskyist, and I can explain it. But Blair was a Trotskyist at the university, pretty much the same time I was, but nobody even knew that until he came out with it in a radio interview a couple of years ago. If he'd said that at any time, uh, between about 1995 and about 2010. It would have been the most explosive news. But because he kept it to himself until after it was all over, nobody cared. Uh, but then very many members of his cabinet were, had similar past, and, and also they don't discuss them either. They're only ever brought out by other people. And it, 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 Peter Hyman, one of Blair's uh, speechwriters and close states, uh, said quite recently in a long article in The, in the Observer that, that the Blair Project was far more revolutionary than anything Jeremy Corbyn ever came up with. In what way? Well, in every way. It's, it, 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 is, it is a huge social, cultural and indeed economic revolution. Look at what happened to spending uh, once Gordon Brown took the, took the brakes off. Uh, look at the en enormous expansion of, of, of spending, the transfer of wealth through things like tax credits, the gigantic the spending on the, on the health service on unprecedented levels, uh, just for instance, and the, the levels of debt in which the country now finds itself are another consequence of that. Then look at the, the, the social and cultural changes, the, virtually the, the abolition of state support for marriage, the de-Christianizing of the country and of, uh, of, uh, of, of sexual politics in general. Uh, the absolute insistence on comprehensive state education and the, the, the banning by law of, uh, of selection by ability in, in any future schools. Enormous. People go about Clause 4. Nobody wants to nationalise the widget industry anymore. That's all. It's a dead issue. The Clause 4 of New Labour was comprehensive education. And comprehensive education which was going to be extended out of the schools and into the universities which is now happening because Oxford and Cambridge have now pretty much surrendered, who were the last real bastions of, of selection by ability, have now begun to, to, uh, to, to surrender to egalitarian uh, principles and will more or less squash selection by ability to do so. And this is an enormous revolution. So even though Labour at present doesn't have political power in the country, you're saying it has, well, it has huge. It, well, it has huge. Well, it, it, the, the reason why New Labour is, is, is dead is because it, it, it handed the torch on to David Cameron. David Cameron was, as he rightly said, the heir to Blair. He and George Osborne referred to, to Blair as the master. Uh, they, they, they wanted actively to imitate not just the, the, the techniques which he developed to get into office, but they, they accepted the whole Blairite settlement as something which they would continue with. Lower levels of spending to some extent, but still extremely high. And the, the whole cultural and moral uh, package of Blairism was entirely swallowed by Cameron. That's why the BBC uh, suddenly switched from being endlessly hostile to the Tory party to being more or less prepared to tolerate it in government, which is how it, the Tory, Tories came back into power in 2010. In a recent piece, you actually uh, said that Boris Johnson um, was better at Blairism than Tony Blair himself. He's, he's, he is, he is. Blair himself was never that good. 
I mean, Blair is nothing like as intelligent or fluent as Johnson. Is, is, that, is that what... The, the intelligent people in Blairism were people like Alistair Campbell, who they never dared put in front of the electorate, because the electorate would have run a mile. Uh, Blair was, was, was put in, in as a front man for public relations reasons, because they, because they needed someone like that, sort of anti-Michael Foote. But he was never, in my view, either bright enough or coherent enough fully to understand the programme he was pursuing. You need to look elsewhere, say for people like, uh, like Alistair Campbell particularly, who was the real genius of the Blair project in government, uh, to see uh, what, a, 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 what, what manner of thing it was. It's quite interesting. I think I read a piece of yours where you said that he's the, Alistair Campbell's the sort of person that you'd actually like to see become an MP. Well, no, I, ha, I mean, I, I would, I, I, I think that the that, that he is um, an immensely more impressive person. Than Blair. Uh, it would certainly be a, a civilized society should certainly be able to tolerate uh, people as difficult and, and in some ways as unattractive as Alistair uh, in party politics. And it would be a lot better uh, if Alistair Campbell had been. Uh, <laughs> as it were, on display as the real face of New Labour, people would have understood much better what it was that they were voting for when they voted for it. I'm not sure I'd go much further. I, quite, I, I don't have much in the way of relations with him now, but at the time was, I quite got on with Alistair. I, I find him an engaging person. He thinks uh, he can express himself. He has strong, uh, enduring principles. They're not mine, but they are real principles, which he's done the fascinating thing about Alistair Campbell is that uh, he's been living with the same woman for decades, uh, has brought up a, 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 a family, but he has never married her. And why is that? Because it's, 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 a, ra it's a radical principle, which, which he and uh, Fiona Miller presumably hold to. They just don't get married. Why do you find Interesting, that isn't it? Because I think that marriage is actually one of the most crucial issues of modern times. And the attitude that people have towards it, particularly on the left, is very telling. That being? Well, the, marriage, lifelong marriage particularly, which existed in, in this country and most of the Western Christian countries until quite recently, lifelong marriage is, uh, was the fortress of private life. Uh, it was the place in which people learned how to be who they were. And it was, it was a rival, a very considerable rival to the state. And it's dismantling into something much, much weaker and more open-ended and, uh, and, and, uh, and having far less influence over the upbringing of children has been a, a huge social change, in my view, for the worse. So let's say Labour went in a direction that you were completely satisfied with. What would be the policies that would have to institute to... Well, I wouldn't be... In, in a, in a two-party... Uh, adversarial system, you can't ever expect to be wholly satisfied uh, with either of the parties. Uh, so it's, and, and I'm, I'm not going to set out a, a manifesto of things that, that, that I would want, uh, because it, we'd be here until the sun had gone down and the bats had begun to fly around the street outside. There's so much to say. Maybe just a couple of things. Well, I'd, I'd say, I, it, for me, as I say, family policy the, uh, is, is, is extremely important. That one has to, one has to it, for a free society to flourish, one has to accept that private life must flourish. In that case, the state must cease the attack. And it's been a very vigorous attack, which it's been making on, on lifelong marriage over the past 50 or more years. So I would want that to stop. I think people should be left alone more to, to, to run their own private lives. I, I think that that goes with the policy of, of, in general, supporting personal responsibility. I don't see any reason why a party supposedly standing for the, for the, for the working poor should be in favour of indulging criminals, uh, should be in favour of, of, uh, of saying that criminals are not responsible for their own actions, that crime is, is a social disease caused by poverty and so on and so forth, which it plainly isn't, since in this country, in the desperate times of unemployment of the 1930s, crime was at far lower levels than it is now, when people are immeasurably better off than they were during the, during the great unemployment period of the 1930s. It's, it just, just simply isn't a sustainable thing to say that, uh, that, that, that crime is caused by poverty. So I would, it, would, it would have to be a complete reversal 
of policies on crime and personal responsibility, and there will also have to be a complete reversal of the comprehensive educational policy, which actually hurts the poor. In 1953, when we still had state-selected grammar schools, which were probably among the best schools in the world, 65% uh, of their pupils were from working-class homes. There isn't a single supposedly good, and it is supposedly because they don't even begin to compare, a single supposedly good comprehensive school which is, could say anything remotely like that. The, the good comprehensive schools, so-called, are immensely socially selective and generally concentrated in well-off areas. And the chances of working-class girls and boys getting into them are slender beyond belief. So that would have to go too. And it, just, it, it doesn't make sense to me, it still doesn't make sense to me, that a party supposedly of the left should adopt an educational policy so damaging to the children of the poor as comprehensive schools. So there's just, that, that, that'll do for a start. Uh, I think possibly, the, uh, the, the, to me, it's also very important that whoever's in charge stops getting involved in wars of choice abroad. Yeah. War, is, a, war, war is, a, is something which sometimes you have to fight, but generally you only have to fight it in self-defense to, to keep people away. Uh, you do not embark on foreign wars. Uh, if you can conceivably avoid it. Yeah, let me just pick up on that last point because you've before said that Tony Blair was responsible for killing the Labour Party and a large part of that, you say, is because of the Iraq war. Yes, I think because that, that was the point at which the, what had been the left realised that, that, that uh, either that they weren't on the left or that the left had changed um, or um, concluded falsely that Blair was on the right. Now, I have a particular advantage in this argument because my late brother, who was an admirer of Leon Trotsky till his dying day and considered himself to be a Marxist till he died, uh, was also a keen su supporter of the Iraq War on basically left-wing utopian grounds. And I think that, uh, that Blair's understanding of this may have been very limited, but the people around him who pursued that policy and who wanted to pursue it were very much influenced by the same utopian leftism that had my brother in its grip. And I think that, that uh, it was a left-wing war. And it puzzled a lot of left-wing people who didn't realise that's what had happened to their movement. It's one of the reasons why I'm not on the left, is that the left has now become the war party. Didn't it see somewhat of the antithesis of that when Jeremy Corbyn became the leader then? Well, yes, he became the leader, but of course he was, he, he was then prevented partly by his own party, remember, from, from becoming prime minister. And one of the main reasons why his own figures in his own party were so opposed to him becoming leader was because of the one thing on which he could be pretty much unequivocally be shown to be right, which is his foreign policy uh, opposition towards stupid foreign wars. Do you think there's ever going to be a, a prime minister that's... No, I don't. I, 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 all this, all this for me is completely theoretical. I think the country's finished. I don't think there's any, any, any hope at all. And I, 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 just, uh, I just discuss it. I don't... I gave up any kind of practical engagement in politics really after 2010 uh, when I thought that an opportunity had been lost to destroy the Conservative Party and replace it with something better. Uh, I sort of had a flicker in 2015 of, of, of trying to revive the, the, the issue simply because I felt I couldn't really do nothing. But then I realised during the 2015 election that doing nothing was actually all there was for me to do. So now I just laugh. Uh. I make, I'll make, I'll campaign against things happening, which I, I campaign against the mad legalisation of marijuana. I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can to prevent involvement in, in new wars. And, uh, and in my journalism, I will tell the truth for its own sake, because that is, as far as I'm concerned, a good in itself. But in terms of engagement in, 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 in politics or in identifying with a political party or supporting a government or supporting an opposition, I just will not do it. This is quite an interesting distinction you're making. So you're saying that you're not going to actively campaign to change anything, but there's a lot you want to concern. Well, the, the, a lot of the things that I want to do is to prevent further changes yes, happening. I'm not, I, change. I'm not, I'm, I, I, I wish to prevent things from happening rather than actually pursue policy. I mean, I, given, a, given the, the three wishes and the power to, to implement them, I've given you a pretty good idea of some directions in which I'd turn. But honestly, uh, I, I, it's, it's very frustrating because I am, I have to boast here, but it's true, I am a one-man think tank. I've gone into all these issues. I've researched the educational problem. I've, I've, uh, I've, I've researched the criminal justice and policing problem. And I, as, as a result, I know that most of what proceeds out of the mouths 
of British politicians on those subjects and many others is pure, ignorant, fatuous drivel. They simply have no... You, hear, you still hear them saying, we want more bobbies on the beat. Bobbies? Beat? There's been no such thing as a bobby for 50 years, or a beat. To say you want more bobbies on the beat is just an expression of, 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 of moronic ignorance. Both you don't know what's happened, you don't know how to tackle it. And, and they say, we, we're going to have more police. What difference does it make if you have more police if they don't do anything? They should do what we hired them to do I mean, under Robert Peel. Go out on the street on foot and patrol individually and prevent crime and disorder. That's what they're for. They were very effective at it. As soon as they stopped doing it and became... Well, here's a simple, simple statement. I, what, it was a simple question to start with. What use is a police officer? unless he or she can do first aid after a crime has been committed. Can't unburgle you, can't unmug you, can't unstab you. It, it, the thing has already happened. Uh, a, a, an arrest is, a, is, 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 is actually a mission of failure. Uh, you, the whole point of the police is to prevent these things from happening in the first place. That's what they do, that's what they did uh, by being present now. Uh, if all the police in this country were abducted by aliens, how long would it take most of us to notice? Because they're never there. The, 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 the closest glimpse you get of a police officer is whizzing by in a car or up there, chattering in a helicopter. You don't see them. It's they're not there. And the whole point, and if you don't see them, the, 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 the bad guys don't see them either. If they don't see them, then their behaviour changes to the worse. It's simple. Uh, and it's, we had, when we had far fewer of them, but they patrolled the streets, they were fine far more effective, crime levels were lower and the prisons were not bursting. So you would say austerity hasn't played much of a role? No, there's no connection between the numbers of police and the, and, and the levels of crime. What about the current crop of Labour leadership contenders? I take it you're not very impressed by them. No, I, why would I be? I see, you know, there is, I th the only tendency in Labour that I have any interest in is, is what's called Blue Labour. And th this, it doesn't feature in any of this. I want, I want to ask you there that. is no socially conservative, um, uh, particularly no socially, no socially conservative candidate in the current Labour leadership crop that I've seen. Uh, could you explain what Blue Labour is, first of all? Well, I suppose what it is, is it's, it's, it's a return to what you might call Attlee and Bevin Labour, when the Labour Party was not socially revolutionary, was, uh, was, was, was still in favour of... of uh, of good education, of the enforcement of law, and, and, and understood, above all things, that it was the, the poorer and the less powerful people in the country who most needed the protection of, a, of an orderly society, as opposed to being a socially radical party for bourgeois bohemians who, who, who don't think that. Uh, so it would be a complete revolution. In, I, this is a, a, a fact, which is very, very hard for most people to cope with, but when the uh, when capital punishment was uh, was under discussion in the 1940s, an attempt was made to suspend it in 1948. Several members of Attlee's cabinet, including Attlee himself, voted to keep it. Can you imagine? Can you begin to imagine any senior Labour figure voting to keep capital punishment now? Attlee is much admired among Labour people. They don't admire that bit of him, but actually it was a key part of him. That's quite interesting, that last thing you said there. Do you think a lot of Labour members just simply don't know all the details of Attlee and Bevan's legacy? Well, they don't understand what sort of Britain it was. I often recommend to people, I've been doing this since I wrote a, a, a book called The Abolition of Britain 20 years ago, a very interesting novel by a, a young Labour MP who died tragically called Wilfred Feenberg, called No Love for Johnny. And what, one of the things it describes, and it's obviously not a biographical novel, is this young MP taking his first drink because he'd been brought up in old-fashioned Methodist temperance, uh, which was, you know, the, 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 that's where an awful lot, particularly of Northern Labour, came from until the middle 60s. People who'd been brought up uh, in church-going, non-drinking, rather puritanical households. And that was Labour. Where's that gone? It's not coming back, is it? I don't know. I, I, to be quite honest with you, given the, the increasing chaos of life on the edges of our society, it might come back. Where do you think temperance came from? Temperance came from the chaos of Gin Lane. And it was invariably uh, the, the, the campaigns to, to try and get some limits on boozing then, and one might make a parallel with marijuana now, that, it, 
came from movements of the poor because they were the ones who suffered from it. The rich could always get out of everything. Now, if, there's, if there's a divorce in a rich family, the children don't suffer half as much as they do in a poor family. If there's crime in, 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 a, in, a, in a poor neighborhood, then it persists. Uh, if there's crime in a rich neighborhood, somebody does something about it. Now, it shouldn't be that way around, should it? And let me just ask you about electoral politics again. Um, Scotland, you, you talked about that earlier. Do you think there's a way for Labour to win back voters from the SNP without essentially caving into their demands and uh, I can't see it. I think once offering you, a second once, once you open the door uh, of, uh, of what was called devolution, once you open the door, you actually opened the door to independence. And the, I find this very odd, but I went up to, to Scotland, a part of Scotland where I did some growing up in the early 50s around Dunfermline and Recife during the last few days of the referendum. And although my, as it were, my political sympathies were very much with the older Scots who I talked to, who were totally opposed, uh, often they were quite left-wing people, they were totally opposed to independence and thought it a folly, I could not in, really find it in my heart to disapprove of the younger Scots who thought, well, why shouldn't we be independent? Uh, to whom the whole idea of, of, of having their own country appealed very strongly. And I could see that in, in time this would, this would become an issue again, and I think it will. I think that the number of, the number of Scots who will want to risk it uh, will grow and grow. And I thought the techniques used against them, the Project Fear te techniques used to try and frighten them out of, out of, out of voting, to, to voting for independence, were unscrupulous and wrong, and I felt they were unscrupulous and wrong when they were used against people who wanted to leave the European Union as well, and, I, and they backfired, as they do. So I think it's a huge problem. I don't think, once you've opened that road, and, and remember that after, after Jim Sillers started talking about Scotland and Europe, everybody understood deep down that what independence meant was Scotland becoming a member of the European Union as Scotland, and therefore bypassing London. Uh, it wouldn't be an, in, an independence of the kind that Scotland lost in 1707. It would be an independence within the European Union of, of limited sovereignty, which, uh, which would be much less adventurous than full independence, which people can see uh, as an appealing option. They look at the small Scandinavian countries and say, well, if they can do it, why can't we? I don't myself find it very hard to argue, to, 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 to see why people would want to do that. I wouldn't myself campaign for it. I wouldn't be in favour of it but I think it's a very, very hard thing to combat. What about I sympathise with it emotionally, but not intellectually. What about in Wales, for example? Well, Wales is a, is a, is a, is a, is a different problem, isn't it? It's not, the, Wales and Scotland are utterly different societies, and, uh, and, and there are a lot of reasons why Wales might be more reluctant to do it. But once Scotland has gone, if Scotland does go, which I suspect it will, and once Northern Ireland has gone, which I think is going to happen too, then the, the Welsh problem will become more pressing. For goodness sake, it could be Cornish independence next, in which case I might have to go down there and join in, because I am Cornish by ancestry. Do you think Labour could potentially lose more seats? I mean, if you look at an area like Wrexham, Labour's held that at every general election since 1935, apart from the most recent one. So do you think there could be more areas like that in Wales where Labour loses it because people think they've been taken for granted? I don't see why not. The question of whether who they lose them to. It's a question of how long the, um, the how, how long Alexander Johnson can keep his balloon in the air. Uh, how long will this government remain a convincing alternative? What's your suspicion? I don't know, but there's no guarantee of success. And just winning a majority is, is is one thing. You can be very good at winning majorities and be no good at anything else. How is this government going to govern? What is its purpose going to be? Uh, is it actually going to successfully negotiate a uh, it's civilised and workable terms for a departure from the European Union, uh, or not. It's not an easy thing to do. It's only just begun. The thing that everyone says, oh, well, we've left the EU now. We haven't. I want to ask we've you begun this. to leave the EU, but we haven't left it. I want to ask you this before. It just, it just hit me. Um, Labour's campaign slogan was, for the many, not the few. Uh, and at the heart of it, there's this idea of class struggle, which, uh, as an ex Bolshevik, I'm sure you're probably aware of. Uh, yeah. that, uh, oddly enough, that was uh, the, the, um, Alistair Cavill used to use the same slogan in 1997.
you think it's an aspect of their messaging it's that's worth preserving? It's just a slogan. Who's going to say? Who's going to stand for election saying for the few, not, not the many? So it's like it's, I think it's Roy Jenkins's law of any political statement. Uh, can you imagine anyone saying the opposite? If not, then it's meaningless. We're in the age of the slogan, though, aren't we? We are, yes, and the soundbite. What do you think? Well, I think, I think well, I think it's it's another it's another um, consequence of educational decline and the decline of individuals as individuals. There used to be a time when more people could see through this sort of thing. Now, now people genuinely believe it. Guinness is good for you. And do you think that's why the get Brexit done cut through? Well, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not. I'm not. As, I'm not a math psychologist. I don't know why people do it. I think one of the reasons people voted for what they voted for is because they were sick of it. That was absolutely for certain. I think people were sick, completely sick of all the, of all the post-referendum wrangling. And, and anybody who offered to bring, bring it to an end would get their vote because they'd had enough of it. And that worked. But it doesn't, doesn't solve the problem of how will they now govern? And who are they anyway? What do they stand for? I don't know. Yes, because I don't know because they don't know. The manifesto was actually uh, the Tory manifesto was quite thin on policy. Of course it was. Yes, I mean, not any <laughs> By design? I don't know. I wasn't there. They didn't ask my opinion. <laughs> um, Labour. Just get back to Labour quickly. Um, it's being investigated by the Equality and Human Rights Commission over allegations of anti-Semitism. Um, do you think it's fair to say Labour's lost the trust of the Jewish community in this country? Who knows? I, um, I, it, all I will say about those, all I've ever said, which is I'm, I'm really pleased to see uh, people beginning to spot uh, the fact that so-called anti-Zionism uh, actually does contain an anti-Semitic element. But if we're going to be consistent on that, then there's an awful lot of people, apart from the Labour Party, uh, who deserve to be examined quite critically. I might, this is a simple point about the State of Israel. It does lots of bad things. My goodness, it does lots of bad things. But it, actually, a lot of other countries do bad things as well. And yet there are some people who spend an absolutely disproportionate amount of time worrying about the bad things that Israel does and don't worry about the bad things other countries do. And you have to ask yourself, why is that exactly? Than that is I'm just asking, why is that? Why would it? Why, no, it's quite small. It's quite a long way away. Why are they so preoccupied with Israel? And you suspect it's anti-Semitism? I didn't say that. I'm just asking a question. You can answer it whatever way you like. It's a fascinating question unanswered. But um, <laughs> there isn't much doubt uh, that uh, that there is a lot of this about, and that it actually governs quite a lot of policy and journalism and academic study. This particular selective criticism of Israel. Well, I'm really glad that people are beginning to see it for what it is, but it's not just the Labour Party that does it. Uh, let's move on to wider aspects of our democratic, uh, democratic system here in Britain. Um, in 2006, you wrote a, a piece, uh, The Real Problem with the British Constitution, and you said, Nobody addresses the most urgent task of constitutional reform, changing or replacing the two decrepit parties which bar the doorway to Parliament. MPs are not really, really elected. They are chosen in more or less safe seats by closed committees of selectors. Uh, firstly, 2006 was a long time ago. just wanted to check. Do, is that something you still believe? Yeah, yeah completely. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a bold statement of the truth. Try to become a member of Parliament and see what happens. You mentioned safe seats there, but is there really such a thing as a safe well, seat? Well, fewer of them than there were, but still quite a few. I think you'll find that, that all political campaigns are waged in a certain number of marginal seats. Uh, I, I happen to live in one of the ones which isn't. You could go through an entire general election campaign and barely notice there was one on. A couple, couple of leaflets, maybe, maybe a, a, a poster or two, otherwise not a sign, because nobody expects it to change hands, so safe seat. But uh, if we, just going by that quote, I mean, you paint a pretty, pretty bleak picture. I mean, we're, we're, we're not as democratic as maybe we think we are in well, this I'm country. Not, I'm not, that doesn't bother me because I'm not, particularly, not a particular enthusiast for universal suffrage democracy. It's quite funny. I used to say this. Uh, I said, it's not, it's not necessarily the best way of, of governing country people. And you could hear people muttering fascist under their breath as I said this. And then along came Donald Trump. 
And then along came the victory of the Leave campaign, the referendum, and all the people used to say, fascist, began to say, yeah, he's got a point, hasn't he? Maybe democracy isn't as good as it was cracked out to be. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's fine as long as it produces the result that you want. But as soon as it doesn't, you begin to question whether it is, in fact, a particularly intelligent way of arranging things. I, the, the Liberty is my concern. Universal suffrage democracy seems to me to be uh, often opposed to liberty. Uh, there's a particularly strong example of this at the moment in Turkey, where uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has pretty much abolished freedom in Turkey by the use of a democratic mandate. But even though democracy can be abused, isn't it still a facet of freedom? Well, it's a facet, but I, to me, the crucial, the, 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 I, I, I start with Magna Carta, I start with the presumption of innocence, with habeas corpus, with, with jury trial. Uh, with Fox's Libel Act, with all the with the with the Bill of Rights, the real fundamental guarantees of liberty lie there, and also with an adversarial parliament, uh, where there is always an opposition, and where that opposition is permanently in a position to take over as government, and the government can be removed at short notice and genuinely removed. I mean, the prime minister can be on the street in Downing Street with his grand piano overnight. That's good. I like that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, that, uh, that universal suffrage democracy is the only way of achieving this. So talk to me about ju jury trials, because that's something we don't debate a lot. People don't debate it at all. They don't, yeah. know, about, they don't know about it. They don't understand it. Yeah. So what, People go and see Henry Fonda sometimes still, I think, in 12 Angry Men. And they think, gosh, isn't that fantastic? And that one man, the jury, can stand up against prejudice and, uh, and ignorance and, and get the right verdict. But in fact, that's not true in Britain anymore, since majority verdicts. The majority verdicts mean that uh, the 12 angry men could not happen in one Britain. One person would simply be overridden, even if he was right. People don't even know when that happened. No, they don't. They say, no, I, I've written a book about it. I'm so, again, one man think tank. I know about all this. I don't, I'm afraid. No, no, no but you should know because jury, yeah. jury trial is a much greater guarantee of, of, of liberty than, uh, than universal suffrage. How so? Just Because it means that the state cannot arbitrarily lock you up. It simply can't. If if you cannot, if habeas corpus operates and you cannot be in prison without the the, the unanimous verdict of of of, uh, of twelve of your peers, then the state cannot lock you up. And a trial, which on the continent is basically a discussion between various civil servants about how long you should go to prison for, a trial is a real unpredictable. Uh, attempt to establish whether you're guilty or not. And it, 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 and, it, and it starts on the presumption that you're not guilty and the, and the state has to prove that you are. This is, you go to countries where this doesn't happen and see the difference. See the difference particularly in the way that, in which the police and the authorities treat people. Uh, these are countries which have identity cards where you have to identify yourself to the state. In this country, it's still just the case that the state has to identify itself to you, which is the right way around. Isn't your desire to see the, the two-party stronghold over Westminster politics broken? Well, two different parties. Well, isn't your desire to see that at odds with your support for first-past-the-post as a voting no. system? No, the first-past-the-post system is essential for the two-party system. You, you, you have a proportional system, then your two-party system breaks it up. The, the key to two-party system is that the coalitions are formed before the election and present themselves to the electorate as coalitions. So you have the, you know, the, the left or the right, they, they, they come forward, they produce a manifesto, so this is what we're going to do. And you can chuck one of them out and put one of them in. You know, as soon as you get a proportional system, the election happens, and then there's perhaps six or nine months of horse trading between the small parties afterwards, over which you have no control. And in, at the end of which the same people who you voted against uh, end up in office with a, with, in a different coalition. It's, it, it destroys a two-party system. But doesn't it make it harder for newer parties to yes, it does. break into it the does, market? But, it, it, but if new parties could break into the market, but then can never ever become anything other than bargainers for, 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 for coalition uh, scraps, then that's not much of an advantage. One of the uh, Labour leadership candidates, Rebecca Long Bailey, has proposed replacing uh, the House of Lords with an elected Senate. What do you think of that? I think you'd then have competition between the, between the two houses of Parliament, uh, in which it would be very hard to work out who was supreme. And since you've just had the catastrophe of the referendum in which two rival democratic mandates contested against each other, uh, in, 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 who, which, which of the two democratic mandates, the elected Parliament or the referendum, uh, was in charge? And that was what all that three years of wrangling was about. So you propose to make that permanent by having two permanent rival elected bodies with different mandates. 
doesn't doesn't. Look I really, it's not very appealing, is it? Well, I'm surprised because th wouldn't that somewhat appeal to you as a social yeah. conservative who yeah, who it's, often it's, thinks? It's just an obvious. It's it's, it's 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 just from a simple engineering point of view, it's it's just obviously it will not work if you've got two competing sources of executive authority. But there'd be more gridlock. And it'll be harder for politicians to ruin the country in your eyes. Well, it might be, but it might not be. I mean, it isn't. It, it's. Uh, it, it also would, would make it harder for anything to be resolved. I don't mind politicians doing nothing when what they plan to do is stupid. But there are some things which need to be addressed, and they can't just be left because the the, the Senate and the House of Commons can't agree. We. Uh, I started by asking about um, a speech Jeremy Corbyn gave back in. Uh, 2015, which you were in attendance for, and I think I'll end there as well. Um, you mentioned in your piece on that that there was a point where you attempted to uh, applaud his opposition to big money in, in British politics. Um, and of course, in this last general election campaign, uh, the Conservative Party raised more than, I think, £5 million oh, in just the first week. Yeah. And uh, you've often talked about how one of the only reasons why the two-party system survives in this country is because... The, uh, the two parties are propped up by what you call dodgy donors. I mean, do, do, well, dodgy donors and also state support. And oh. people say there's no, uh, the, 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 there's, there's no state money for parliament, but they haven't heard of the short money, which of course goes to the opposition parties, and is yeah. very substantial, uh, which I, I also don't favour. Uh, no, I think the, the individual donations should be limited. Uh, I should think probably to a maximum of £50 per person, and there should be no corporate donations. Full stop. Uh, the, 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 I think the, the Conservative Party's relationship, particularly with property developers, and since 2010 has been shocking. Uh, but the, the whole business of, of, of how money can be used as well. Uh, technically, uh, elections are supposed to take place in constituencies, but uh, national advertising and uh, all kinds of targeting can, can, can uh, as far as I can see, can be used to bypass the the spending limits in constituencies in, in, in very important ways. I think this is wrong. Do you, do you think this has an impact on, on policy? A huge, yes. Can you name a specific area? You talk about property developers, maybe? Well, I, know what the, what the, the, I think the, the, the plainly, uh, quite plainly, the Conservative Party's attitude under David Cameron towards the, you know, the concreting over the countryside was, was much more favourable than it had previously been. So if Labour came out on a ticket which maybe prioritised that as an issue, do you think that would hit home with a lot of people? Or? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not offering advice to anybody else, no, but I, I think that is something that did happen. Um, people don't donate to political parties solely out of a devotion to the democratic ideal, I don't think. But there... Even if you impose regulations, for example, say, I think there was a 2011 report which said that um, they, they should cap the amount of large individual donations to £10,000 um, per person. Hard. But couldn't people just get around it? You know, know. In the US you have bundling. You have, to, you have to find ways of enforcing it. I mean, if you want to enforce a law, you always can. Uh, the, the laws that don't get enforced are not enforced because people don't want to enforce them. If you wanted to enforce it, you could. Peter, thank you.